Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. <clears throat> you may remember this song. Anna Tevka, Anna Tevka, da 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 da, Anna Tevka. This is a fiction. To my surprise, you remember that scene at the end of Fiddler on the Roof when the Jewish inhabitants of Te Tevya's Ukrainian village have now been transformed into refugees, leading from fleeing for North and South America, fleeing for what was then called Palestine, fle fleeing for Western Europe wherever they might find a home again. But to my surprise, there never was a town called Anatevka. That was the fictional name that Shalom Aleichem invented to represent every shtetl, wherever an Eastern European Jew made a home. I was interested to learn in the Jewish press this week that in 2016, in the wake of the turmoil that took place then in Eastern Ukraine, Rabbi Moshe Osman established a refugee center outside of Kiev in the event that any residents, any Jewish residents of the city needed to evacuate. And he called that refugee site Anatevka. And again, earlier this week, Rabbi Osman this time sent pre-recorded voice messages to the telephones, the cell phones of thousands of Ukrainian Jews, inviting them, should they need to flee, to come and take shelter in a place called Anatevka. Jews have lived in Ukraine for well over a thousand years. Over many centuries, Jews have fled persecutions in Western and Central Europe to settle in the Ukraine. Today, there are approximately 100,000 Jews living in Ukraine. That's just a small fraction of the total population. And yet, remarkably, the UK Ukrainian president, Zelensky, a former actor and comedian elected to office in 2019, is Jewish. I remember when I heard this news, I posted something about it in Facebook <clears throat> to call attention to how things really can change. My grandfather, Splansky, fled his hometown just outside of Kiev when he was a boy to come to America to escape the relentless anti-Semitism that the Ukraine was known for then. Now the Jews of the region fear that no matter how this conflict might play out, they could be blamed. <clears throat> they might be blamed on both sides of the Russian-Ukrainian border. <clears throat> Western countries have just offered President Zelensky safe passage out of Ukraine, but he has declined, saying, I don't need a ride, I need weapons. So this Shabbat we pray for President Zelensky, Ze'ev, Ben, Rima, and for his family who are in hiding. You may recall Rabbi Tanya Sachnovich came to visit Holy Blossom Temple a few years back. She is currently in the Ukraine as her son is studying at the University of Kiev. And earlier this week she wrote, I spent the whole morning in the queue trying to buy train tickets. There were people trying to get back to Poland, Austria, Germany, the Netherlands, and Ukrainian city citizens trying to reach family in Europe. We all got to know each other and each other's stories, how we ended up in Kiev. I learned a lot in that queue about what was happening in real time around the country. And we shared different advice with one another. We bought water for each other. There was a sense of solidarity that was amazing, crossing all boundaries. 
I have even started to improve my Ukrainian. And when the rabbi got to the ticket counter, she asked for a ticket to anywhere. The shops, she writes, are bare in most cities. We are not able to exchange money. The bank was closed. On the way back, I saw a lot of people downstairs in our building, our tall apartment building. We thought that the elevators had stopped working, but instead, people were there because they were waiting for air attacks, and so they stayed on the lower level. My son suggested that we take beer and snacks downstairs to boost people's spirits and to get to know our neighbors. I share these words with you to paint a bit of a picture of what people who are very close to us are experiencing now. I know we feel helpless on this side of the ocean watching the unfolding catastrophe from afar. Rabbi Carl Perkins reminds us that there are three things we can do. He takes a page from our High Holiday Machzor with the three categories, teshuva, tefillah, and staka. Teshuva, we must ask ourselves, what have we done and what have we not done as citizens of the West, as citizens of the world, that allowed to give rise to this? Tefillah, we've included in our prayers already today and we will continue to pray for the people of Ukraine. And staka, there are many ways to give. I'll mention by name the Joint Distribution Committee. The JDC is the leading global Jewish humanitarian organization. And they are very active now bringing uh, basic needs and, and protection to Jews of all stripes across Ukraine and the surrounding areas. And if you wish to specifically support the, our sister congregations, the Reform Jewish Congregations of Ukraine, you can find at the top of our website, Holy Blossom Temple, the link to a new fund that has been established by the World Union for Progressive Judaism so that we can support and protect our sisters and brothers at this time of distress. You may recall that quote, power corrupts. There's a second part to this quote of the 19th century British politician, Lord John Dalton Acton. He famously asserted, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Putin's imperialist attack on Ukraine seems to have come from a page of history, from an age of empires and an age of kings. The Hebrew Bible warns against the rule of kings, at least for Israel. Kings may be fitting for other nations, but Israel was to be ruled by Melech Malchei Hamlachim, by the divine ruler who rules above and beyond all human rulers. In the book of Proverbs, it is written, by justice a king sustains the land, but a, a fraudulent man tears it all down. But we wanted a king. Our ancient Israelite ancestors wanted a king to be a nation like all other nations. In the first book of Samuel, it is recorded that we cried out in desperation, Ki melech tasim aleinu, give us a king to rule over us. And so God made a concession, perhaps out of love, perhaps out of pity. But it comes with instruction. Our Torah is very clear in the book of Deuteronomy. When you enter the land that the judge of all the earth, your God, is giving to you, and you come to possess it and settle in it, you might say to yourselves, set a king over us and let us be like all the nations that are around us. And so you may set, yes, you may set over yourselves a ruler, 
but only the one that the creator of all your uh, the creator of all your god chooses for you from among your siblings you may set over you a ruler you may not place over you a foreign person who is not a sibling to you let them not have multiple horses and they are not to return the people to Egypt for the sake of multiplying his horses. Since the ruler of the earth has said to you, you shall never return to Egypt again. And also be careful that your king does not take on multiplied spouses and that their heart is not turned aside so that they grasp for silver and gold in excess. Why does the Torah warn us about a king who amasses horses and wives and silver and gold? Because that's what human kings do. And that is exactly what King Solomon did. It is recorded in the first book of Kings King Solomon excelled over all the kings of earth in wealth and in wisdom. And all the world came to pay homage to Solomon and to listen to his wisdom with which God endowed him. Each one brought his tribute, silver and gold, robes, weapons and spices, horses and mules. Solomon assembled chariots and horses for himself. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses, which he stationed in the chariot towns and with the king in Jerusalem. And so the Torahitic law retroactively warns against unchecked political power. How must a king of Israel rule instead? It is written in our Torah. When a king comes to sit on the throne of their dominion, they are to write for themselves a copy of this Torah. Before the presence of the Levitical priests, they must write it to make sure there's no change that would favor the king. And that Torah is to remain beside the king who is to read of it every day of his life in order that he will become learned, that he will learn to have awe for the judge of all the earth, their God, and to be careful concerning all the words of this Torah, to be mindful of these laws, to observe them so that their heart might not be raised above their siblings, that they might not turn aside from what is commanded, not turning to the right or to the left, only if they do this, their days will be long. And the days of their progeny will be long in the midst of the people of Israel. These verses of our Torah give rise to millennia of additional laws about how one might rule a country. And the, the country of Israel, the people of Israel in particular. Remarkably, in times when there was no Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel, those laws continued to be embellished and written in anticipation of the day that there would be sovereignty in the land and there would be a ruler over the land of Israel. In the early rabbinic texts of the Mishnah, Sanhedrin, it is written that when the king goes out to war, he must bring that Torah with him and when he comes in from war, he must bring that Torah with him. And when he sits in judgment on the throne, that Torah must be with him. And when he reclines to eat, that Torah must sit opposite him as it is stated, and it shall be with him and he shall read from it all the days of his life. Remarkably, Maimonides in 12th century Egypt when there was no immediate glimmer of hope that there might be a king of Israel, he wrote chapters about the laws of the kings of Israel. And so what 
must rule over every human king? The law. The law must set boundaries and borders to contain the king's power. We saw this when Prime Minister Trudeau recently leveraged the Emergencies Act for the first time. He declared a no-go zone to bring order to the chaos of the so-called Freedom Convoy. By invoking the Emergencies Act, police were permitted to freeze truckers' personal and corporate bank accounts and to compel tow truck companies to haul away vehicles from Ottawa's downtown core. Was this the right thing to do or not? That is up to you to decide. But it is a brilliant example of how Canadian law also attempts to give the Prime Minister power and limit it. Trudeau said, we were very clear that the use of the Emergencies Act would be limited in time. And it was, true to his word, because a Prime Minister is not a king. Not long ago, many citizens of Israel, even those who favored Netanyahu's security politics, agreed that it was time for him to go. Time for him to leave office because his reign was too long. Corruption had set in. He had served 15 years, the longest serving Prime Minister of Israel. As uneasy as, un as ancient Israel was with the rule of human kings, so ought we be. The modern state of Israel must only be led not by kings, but by prime ministers whose power is limited by the law. So let me conclude with a prayer that comes out of Ukraine. We stand in solidarity with the Jewish communities there, and we pray for the protection of the thousands of people who at this very hour are risking arrest by peacefully protesting throughout Russia and the neighboring countries. We pray for those who are defending their country of Ukraine. We pray that peace and calm will swiftly be restored to the region. And this concluding prayer for peace comes from none other than Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav, a Ukrainian Hasidic Rebbe whose grave is still celebrated each year before Rosh Hashanah. Thousands of Jews come from all over the planet to pray in Uman, Ukraine. He wrote in his time, centuries ago, may we see the day when war and bloodshed cease, when a great peace, a shalom rav, will embrace the whole world, when all who live on earth shall realize we have not come into being in order to hate and destroy. We have come into being to praise, to labor, and to love. Let God's peace fill the earth as the waters fill the sea. And together we say, Amen.